broadcast. Just hearing that sound and knowing the words that go with it are inviting us into the presence of the Almighty in a powerful way. We thank you, Lord, that you ask us to come and sing praises to you, that you give us our heart's deepest longing as you bring us into your presence and as you bring us into a deeper relationship with you, each and every one of us, each and every day. We praise you, Lord. We thank you, Lord, that you are with us. You lead us, you guide us, you follow us, you pick us up. Yep. And we're going to just sing how much we love you, Lord. And so would you stand and sing together. Joyful, joyful, we adore thee. but he's waiting for me to introduce him. So everyone give Richard a hand as he gets his little self up here. Come on, Richard. Woohoo! He wants children's attention too. If you guys want to come on down. You don't have to run, but you guys naturally move at a slightly different pace from the rest of us. Yeah. I used to be that fast once. Long time ago. Ah, oh, well, good morning to y'all. How's everybody doing this fine Sunday morning? Yeah, that's what I like to hear. Okay, I want to talk to you young and you young at heart. The center of the Bible. You ever heard of that? This is, you know, this. There we go. My head only goes so far. 
you can take it out. <laughs> yeah. yeah, how's that? Okay. Did you know the shortest chapter in the Bible is Psalm 117? The longest chapter in the Bible is Psalm 119. The very center of the Bible is Psalm 118. There are 594 chapters before 118. There are 594 chapters after 118. Add them all up. What does it give you? 1,188. What is, this, what is the central verse of the Bible? Now here's where it gets interesting. Psalm 118 verse 8 it is better to take refuge in the Lord than to trust in man this verse says something very significant about God's perfect will in our lives we're told to trust in him rather than people if we do that we find it much easier to stay in the center of his will Many times we are tempted to place our trust in people rather than Christ. We, are, we tend to trust what we see and feel. Placing our trust in God when we can't see him is where faith comes in. Many times we can't see or feel the sun, but we don't doubt its existence simply because it's hidden behind the clouds. And there are times we can't feel the wind. Do you still believe that the air exists even when you can't feel it or hear it? To stay in the center of God's will requires faith. And faith is trusting without seeing. The next time someone says he'd like to find God's perfect will for his life or her life, or that he wants to be in the center of God's will, just send him to the center of God's will. Isn't it odd how that works out? Or could it be God is in the center of it? Amen. Great children's story, right? Yeah. We're all God's children, right? We are his sons and daughters. Hallelujah. So this morning, we have beautiful flowers. Some of the flowers that are here are for the singers. 57 years of marriage today. Hallelujah. Congratulations, Wayne. That's awesome. Also, we have altar flowers from the Santo Pietros for Stella's birthday. It's Stella's birthday today. Amen. Happy birthday, Stella. We love you. Happy we gotta sing. To you. Happy birthday. So, uh, announcements, please fill out your yellow cards. We have such a faithful group of prayer warriors, you guys. Every Tuesday we lift these up. And I would ask you, too, if you have updates to your previous prayer requests, please send them in to Wayne so we can keep our prayer list effective and up-to-date. And if you're new with us, we'd love for you to fill this out, put your information on it so we can tell you hello. Okay, also, we don't have a lot of uh, uh, announcements, but we do have a special night tonight. What is tonight? Healing. healing service. You guys, our monthly healing services are very, very special. And so tonight we have Rob Stark from Lamplighter Revival Center, 
And so you want to come in. There's going to be healing. He carries <coughs> healing and refreshing. Just come in. Uh, if you need encouragement, we have prayer teams that will be praying for you. And so we invite you to come. There's just something that happens in the atmosphere when we come together. So please come tonight, 6 o'clock. Uh, we have prayer at 5 if you want to join us in the fireside room beforehand. So anything else, you guys, check out your bulletins. There's all kinds of uh, groups getting together, small groups. We have even have, I think they play dominoes on Wednesday. So <laughs> join in. So check these out. We have some, some great Bible studies and groups that meet during the week. So we want to pray over the offering now. You know, we are so blessed. We have a, a, a God who just provides so well for us. And we get to just give back to him for the work of the ministry. And so, Father, we thank you. God, we want to bless you. We want to worship you with our tithes and offerings today. And, Lord, I ask that you just bless each one who's here today, whether they can give today or not, Father. We know your blessings are for each one of us. So, Lord, we thank you. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 Good morning, church. Happy Sunday to each and every one of you. How is everyone doing this morning? Excited to be in the house of the Lord? Amen. I'm going to invite everyone to go ahead and stand on your feet if you are able. We're going to praise and worship the Lord. Amen. together. He's coming on the clouds. Kings and kingdoms will bow down. And every chain will break. His broken heart declare his praise. Who could stop the Lord Almighty? Our God is the Lion, the Lion of Judah. He's roaring with power and fighting battles and every knee will bow before him. Our God is the Lamb, the Lamb that was slain for the sins of the world. His blood break the chain and every knee will bow before the Lion and the Lamb and every knee will bow before him. Oh, Let's sing and declare. Show open up the gates. Make way before the King of Peace. The only one. The God who comes to save. Is here to set the captives free. For who can stop the Lord Almighty? We sing. Our God is the Lion and the Lion of Judah. He's roaring with power and fighting our battles and every day you bow before him our God our God is the lamb the lamb that was slain for the sins of the world his blood break the chain and every day you bow before the lion and the lamb and every day you bow before him but who could stop the Lord Almighty who could stop the Lord Almighty? No, but who could 
Church, let's declare. Our God is the lion and the lion of Judah. He's roaring with power and fighting a battle. And every day you will bow before him. Our God is the lamb, the lamb that was slain for the sins of the world. His blood breaks the chain. And every day you will bow before the lion and the lamb. Every knee will bow before him, and every knee will bow before the lion and the lamb, and every knee will bow before him. Come on, if you believe it, come on, lift up your hands. Hallelujah, we praise you, Jesus. Come on, church, follow us with your hands. Blessing in honor, glory in power, be to the ancient of days. From every nation, all of creation, bow before the ancient of days. And every tongue in heaven and earth shall declare your glory. Every knee shall bow at your throne and worship you be. Exalted, O oh God, and your kingdom shall not pass away, O oh, ancient of days. Come on, let's declare blessing, blessing in honor, glory in power, be unto the ancient of days. From every, from every nation, all of creation bow before the ancient of days as we confess for every tongue in heaven and earth shall declare your glory every knee shall bow at your throne in worship you be exalted O oh god and your kingdom shall now pass away O oh, ancient of days Come on, church, let's declare this part as we sing. Your kingdom shall reign over all the earth. Sing to the ancient of days. But no one confess to him matchless worth. Sing to the ancient of days. For every tongue in heaven and earth shall declare your glory. Every knee shall bow at your throne. Shame, you will be exalted, O oh God, and your kingdom shall not pass away, O oh, ancient of days. Your kingdom shall reign over all the earth. Hallelujah. Yes, Jesus, you reign. God is good, amen. He's always good. Father, we exalt you. We praise you, Jesus. We lift our hands, Father. We surrender our worship to you, Lord, for you are worthy to be praised. Hallelujah.
ourselves from the truth of who you are and let ourselves follow other ambitions or other idols or other concerns or worries. Thank you, Lord, that you continually pursue us to make us your own and to grow us closer and closer into who you want us to be. We thank you, Lord, that you take us wherever we are. You walk with us. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord, that there's nothing about us that makes you turn your face the other direction. There's nothing about us that makes you wince. Even though we walk in confusion, even though we walk in shame, even though we walk in darkness, you are our light. And you're calling us ever out of those places, out of that pit, into your eternal light. 
and you give us this assurance that no matter what we've been through, no matter what we're going through, no matter what we face, you're there with us. We thank you, Lord. We thank you. We thank you. I love this testimony in our prayer cards. It says, Lord, I praise you every day for healing, hope, love, forgiveness, and your grace. As I follow down this long and narrow road with you, it's the only road to freedom and peace. Thank you, Lord. I love you, Lord. You know who wrote it, but it's our, all of our prayers, Lord, that you would take us through. And in taking us through, we would sing out your praise in every step. Last week's message included Paul saying, yet I'm afflicted, but I believe. Even in the midst of affliction, Lord, your people sing your praise. We sing your praise. So Lord, we do come before you on behalf of many of our company here and the people on our hearts. We lift Dan up to you as his prayer request came out. And Lord, that curse of cancer, we curse it back, Lord. Not just on him, but on all of those in our, in our prayer list. We do this on Tuesday. We say, cancer, you have to bow to the name of Jesus. And we curse your presence among us and say, you may not have our brother Dan. You may not have Susie. You may not have any of us or any of our loved ones. And Lord, we thank you that no matter what we face, you're carrying us through. Lord, we ask that you be with Dawn and her sister Debbie this week. Is the surgery still on? As this kidney transplant, Lord, it's an amazing thing that you have taught us how to interact with these amazing bodies that you've created in such a way that we could borrow a part from one to another. But we ask for healing both before the surgery, in the surgery, and through the surgery, and in the recovery, Lord. Guard and protect shield and be the guide of all those involved and thank you lord that you already see the finished product and we can trust in your grace and your promises and lord we've been praying for angelito for quite a while and we thank you that he is home after that gunshot wound but two months later he's still recovering and we ask that you continue to be with him and thank you lord there's folks that are dealing with chronic pain, both physically and depression or anxiety-wise, sort of those mental struggles. And one point that I saw this week said, even depression has physical consequences. So these things, Lord, that plague your people, we ask that you be with those who are dealing with that chronic pain, whether it's in a nerve or a joint or the headaches or the neck aches or the fear or the depression. Lord, we come against that. And we ask that your light shine on us individually and through us to one another, that we be that whole body. When one suffers, we all suffer. When one rejoices, we all rejoice. Help us, Lord, to do an even better job of caring one for another and supporting each other through this, the pain or the anxiety and the recovery. Lord, there's family members we've been praying for. There's family members that break our hearts. There's family members that we worry over. Help us to convert that worry into prayers of trust. But we know that there isn't a person that we care about that you don't already know, that you don't already care for, that you don't already pursue. It's an amazing concept, Lord, that you would leave the 99 to go after the one. You've come after us. And Lord, we lift in our hearts those that come to mind that we long to see, experience your love. That your, we know your love is there. We know your grace is there. And even that you surround them, even in difficult places, even when we can't say where they are, you are still with them. Bless them, Lord. We especially lift up Eric. There's digestion issues, there's stomach pain, there's so many things, Lord, that our team will be praying about on Tuesday, but even now, we know that you know. Help us to know even deeper how much you see and how much you're willing to carry us and what you're already done for us. 
Lord, sometimes we get stuck on what we see or what we let be distractions. Lord, help us to release those distractions and see your presence. Whether it's the storms of caring for a loved one or the storms of our own health or the storms of culture or the storms of politics or the storms of whatever it is, Lord. Help us to see past those waves and keep our eyes on you. You do amazing things in us, Lord. Amazing things through us. We have beheld your glory. And you said you want that glory to shine through us. So help us shine, Lord. Help us shine. Thank you for your love. Our dear, beloved Father. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. So as Derry comes up to read, I want you to try something a little bit different. We're talking, we have been for a couple weeks, talking about the Holy Spirit. And the a core affirmation is that it doesn't really matter what we think or what we feel or even what we believe. God is God. Holy Spirit is God. God has said, when we say, yes, Lord, I need you, Holy Spirit lives within us. It's a different status. It's a different creation, a different reality. So to practice, in your bulletin is a printout of today's scripture. As you read along and as you listen to Daria reading it, Lord, I would ask you, Holy Spirit, that you would bring to our individual attention a verse that you want us to think about and meditate on as individual disciples. Listen. Let the Holy Spirit bring your attention. There are some passages here that change our world if we let them sink in. So let the Holy Spirit bring something to your attention and then use that later in the day to meditate. Or if you get bored with the sermon, do it during the sermon. <laughs> but the Holy Spirit is the one who is here to minister to each and every one of us. Each and every one of us. According to his plan, his purpose for us. I said to somebody recently, you know, if you ever have trouble with a sermon, just get the scripture out and let the Lord lead you. You don't have to listen to everything that comes at you. But the Lord is always always pursuing us, drawing us in. So let's hear what he does for us today through this passage in the third chapter of Ephesians. You know, sometimes it's hard to keep it together because just listening to what Raleigh said about him pursuing us, you know, his love for us just uh, overtakes me sometimes. So I'll try not to cry. I love this scripture, Ephesians 3, 1 through 21. For this reason, I, Paul, the prisoner of Christ Jesus, for the sake of you Gentiles, surely you have heard about the administration of God's grace that was given to me for you, that is, the mystery made known to me by revelation, as I have already written briefly. In reading this, then, you will be able to understand my insight into the mystery of Christ, which was not made known to people in other generations, as it has now been revealed by the Spirit to God's holy apostles and prophets. This mystery is that through the gospel, the Gentiles are heirs together with Israel, members together of one body and sharers together in the promise in Christ Jesus. I became a servant of this gospel by the gift of God's grace 
given me through the working of his power. Although I am less than the least of all the Lord's people, this grace was given me to preach to the Gentiles the boundless riches of Christ and to make plain to everyone the administration of this mystery for which for ages past was kept hidden in God who created all things. His intent was that now, through the church, the manifold wisdom of God should be made known to the rulers and authorities in the heavenly realms according to his eternal purpose that he accomplished in Christ Jesus our Lord. In him and through faith in him, we may approach God with freedom and confidence. I ask you, therefore, not to be discouraged because of my sufferings for you, which are your glory. For this reason, I kneel before the Father, from whom every family in heaven and on earth derives its name. I pray that out of his glorious riches, he may strengthen you with power through his spirit in your inner being, so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith. And I pray that you, being rooted and established in love, may have power together with all the Lord's holy people to grasp how wide and long and high and deep is the love of Christ. And to know this love that surpasses knowledge, that you may be filled to the measure of all the fullness of God. Now to him who is able to do <clears throat> immeasurably more than all we ask or imagine according to his power that is at work within us. To him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations forever and ever. Amen. <coughs> Thank you, Daria. Holy Spirit will do that. Overwhelm us at the simplest things. Can I tell the story, one more story on you, Daria? Sure. <laughs> she was telling us this, this morning as we were praying that at one point while she was in her kitchen, a bird flew in through the doggy door, which meant that the bird, this little bird, pushed open the doggy door doggy door, flew in, sort of landed near her. She opened the window and it flew out. And then she listened to a devotional that day and it was about God's eyes on the sparrow and how he attends to us and cares for us even more than the little birds. It's like those two messengers working together to say, I see you, I'm with you, I'm always there. Don't fear. I take care of these little birds. I don't know how a little bird pushed that doggy door open. <laughs> Didn't see the angel help him out. But God is there. And the amazing thing about this Holy Spirit is it's not contingent on us. It's not our power. It's not our coming to a reasonable conclusion about having studied all the commentaries and analyzed everybody else's thought and said, okay, now I agree with two-thirds of this one, one-third of that one. Well, no, let's adjust that. That's three-fifths of this one. No. We could go crazy trying to figure out the intellectual pieces of this. I remember talking one time about a Bible study method that I was hearing from the mission field it was basically, read the passage. What does that say about God? What does it say about humans? What does it say to do? They didn't have commentaries. They didn't have the internet. They were lucky when they had the written word at all. I was reading about a pastor in China who had actually been a secular communist and got in trouble because, well, he wasn't a communist. Scratch that part. He had been a rebel and he had been trying to do the dem dem democracy in China as a atheist, had to run and flee for his safety, ended up in some village, and a 90-year-old who only had a handwritten copy of the Gospel of John 
She couldn't read. She asked him to read it to her. He was hiding out. He started reading with her. And she brought him to the Lord. And he became a pastor. The Holy Spirit can do immeasurably more than we could ever ask or imagine. The Lord is... The Lord is not on vacation. I don't care how much you pay attention to whichever news channel you watch and you think the world is going to hell in a handbasket. The Lord is not on vacation. He is attentive to every single one of his children. He knows every one of our needs. He knows the needs of everyone out there, the prodigal sons and daughters that he is still wooing to himself. It says in... I think it's Psalm 139, that so vast are your thoughts of me that were they numbered in the sand, they, I couldn't count them. I mean, and that's just not the psalmist, that's every one of us. His thoughts, his ability to be attentive to us is as vast as the universe is big. We cannot imagine this. Our brains cannot wrap themselves around this. The closest we can get is to say, yes, Lord. I just praise you, Lord, and I want to follow you, and I want to be led by you in each and every circumstance. <clears throat> and this walking with the Lord is true no matter what we face. Paul writes this letter from prison. Do you hear, woe is me, in any of these words? He reminds them that he's suffering And he certainly has suffered in his walk with the Lord. But at this point in time, he's talking about the truth of who we know God is, even in this prison. And if you look at it, it took Paul being in prison for us to get a whole bunch of the New Testament. People look at Ephesians and Colossians in particular, and they talk about the fact that, okay, he's looking at what's happening over there in modern-day Turkey while he's sitting in prison in Rome and he's hearing reports and he's collecting his thoughts. Ephesians is such a, a collection of his, okay, here's what I know. Here's what the Lord's taught me. The first three chapters are like a doctrine that if, if we could, every word is so full of meaning, we could spend hours and hours and hours per verse on each verse, not perverse as a word, on each verse, <laughs> because it's so meaty. And then starting with chapter four, he talks about what we do to live this out. And he's doing this summary to send to the church at Ephesus, and then the rest of the churches are supposed to read this. So it's literally sent to us that we might read this and hear it and put it into practice. Now, it's interesting, some of the context that we're dealing with here. At one point, this church in Ephesus had Apollos go and be their primary preacher. And he was a great orator. He had come from Egypt. So somehow, the message of Christ, was he there at Pentecost? Don't know. But he, what we know about him is he leaves Alexandria, north coast of Egypt, and ends up in Corinth and then Ephesus, Priscilla and Aquila, two other leaders in the church, teach him about the gospel, but he becomes a primary teacher in Ephesus. And in Acts chapter 19, Paul shows up at Exodus, uh, F, not Exodus, Ephesus. <laughs> not everyone, you don't have to feel bad when you can't pronounce the words on the reading. Just saying. And he asked the people, well, what, what ministry, have you been baptized by the Holy Spirit? This is in the first verse or two of chapter 19 of Acts. And they don't know what the Holy Spirit is. And this is even after somebody who is uh, venerated in the, in the gospel, well, in the book of Acts, as a leader in the church, he didn't know what the Holy Spirit was. He only preached based on what John the Baptist had said, which is a good message. Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. God's going to do a new thing. We need to be ready. But then Paul, there at Ephesus, 
teaches them about the Holy Spirit. And it looks like everything is going well. He's spent some time there. Uh, but Ephesus is an interesting place. If you look in Acts, one of my favorite, I mean, there's so many battles going on. Not unlike what we have today. There's so many contentious perspectives swirling around us, not unlike what was swirling around them. At one point, there's basically a riot because all these merchants who sell handmade idols to the resident goddess in the town are distressed because Paul's message has gotten so through to the people that they're deciding they're going to quit worshiping this pagan god. Their motivation isn't religious. Their motivation is economic because they're losing revenue because people have abandoned the pagan worship. And so they, they, they bring Paul and his compatriots up on charges and they're about to have a riot. In fact, they do. But the, the magistrate says, be civil. If you have a complaint, come to the governing council and we'll talk about it. There's such a move of the Holy Spirit through Paul that people who have been practicing occult bring and burn their manuscripts, their books, because they've realized that they've been serving evil, falsehood, and they have to say no to that. Things look, he's moving with such power that there's a Jewish family, a guy has seven sons, and they see Paul ministering, evil spirits being cast out, people being healed. They see this move of the Holy Spirit coming through him, and they decide, well, we're going to do that. So they go after this person who's demon possessed all seven of these brothers, and they start to cast out the demon. And it's, oh, well, Paul I know, and Jesus I know, but who are you? And this one man beats up all seven of them, and they run away naked and bloodied, unsuccessful. And there's a fear, it says in Acts 19, that just comes over the whole area, because there's power in this message. There's power that changes lives. There's power that changes communities. There's power that changes the world. And we are recipients of that. Five or six years have gone by, and Paul's writing this letter. The struggle hasn't ended, though. He is articulating a very clear declaration of what Christ has done, what God has done through salvation by sending his son, the whole, if you look at the three chapters, it's just such a clear declaration of what we know as Christians. But we also know that because he's sending the letter of Colossians, which is just a, not too far away, another town in this area, and these letters are supposed to both go out at the same time and are supposed to be shared, that a lot of heresies have come in. When I say heresy, and when I talk about the heresies of that day, we have them just as present among us now. One of the heresies was brought in by people who thought, you've got to follow these rules. You can't live with this much freedom. You've got to live under these structures. And unless you live under these structures, you're not good enough for God. Whether we think that way because of something someone said to us or we think that way because of condemnation in our own head, we have to contend against that heresy in our own lives. Another one was basically reconnecting with elemental spirits, witchcraft. If I manipulate the world this way, I'll get what I want. If I do this, I, there was even this thought that these angels, and they would, what they would have been would have been demons. These demons, we can work with them, and if we make friends with them, they'll give us what we want. I've heard people who have come out of the occult, and they said, yeah, we knew how to manipulate energy. It's out there. You can learn and be taught how to do it, and you can cast spells and 
witchcraft is still a thing. Witchcraft was coming into this environment because the witchcraft that had been there didn't want to let it go. There was another mindset that basically said, you know, this Jesus guy, we can't really think of him as a fully human person. If all of us would just think better, become more sophisticated in our brain, you know, we would know that this flesh stuff would eventually pass away. And it's just about being enlightened enough. There's people on TV who will tell you, if you just get a little bit more enlightened, everything will be okay. We worship our own intellect. That's still present. Paul speaking into all of that and reminding them that there has been a new truth that has happened. In chapter 1 of Ephesians, he talks about the salvation that Jesus gave through the cross and through the resurrection. And that we were sealed by the Holy Spirit. So this work of the cross and this receiving it into us is not based on our not based on the adequacy of our following a certain prescription of catechism. It's not based on us having the right number of steps into the faith. It's based on us recognizing that we need what he's offering and we're willing to say, yes, Lord. And when we say, yes, Lord, Holy Spirit himself, the Lord Almighty himself becomes a part of who we are. Even if we don't know how to walk with the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is in us, continuing to teach us. And that teaching us is an everyday, lifelong, our whole lifelong process. I love this phrase near the end of our reading that says that he can do more than we ask or imagine. He's, this is declaration, verse uh, 20. Even the larger print's not big enough, Richard. I know what you mean. <laughs> now to him who's able to do immeasurably more. So it's not just more. It's unmeasurably more. How big is the universe? Immeasurably more than all we ask or imagine according to his power that is in work within us. His power at work within us, right now, each and every one of us, is already able to do immeasurably more than we could ever ask or imagine. That's the promise. It's not the reward once we pass the test. That's the beginning point. And then we walk a lifetime with him. From wherever we start walking, we walk a lifetime with him. Whether that's young or old, whether it's new this week, or whether it's been... 70 years, there is immeasurably more than we can ask or imagine still waiting for us. Because I guarantee, as <coughs> big-brained as we think we are, it's small compared to the Almighty. Humility is a thing for a reason. We want to think that we're put, you know, we tend to put God in a box, and when we do that, it's because we think we know better. And people will tell us that they do know better. There's this one guy that, I don't see him much anymore, so I don't know if he's still around. I saw his name mentioned recently, and just because I don't want to be mean about the gossip piece, he basically said, I've studied all the world religions, and let me tell you what they all say. Here's the truth. He's basically said, okay, it's, you Christians, yeah, you only get part of the idea. You need to Water it down, and here's the least common denominator, and I'm telling you that this is the truth. I like what one person recently said in my presence, God's truth is true. And there's other truth that we, we, we learn and come to know that's not in the Bible, but everything is subject to that initial truth. Knowing how to do a kidney translate, transplant, the instructions to that is not in the Bible. Knowing how the body works is still subject to what God does and what God says and that he's in charge. 
You know, medicine has evolved. They used, I saw a movie the other day where they're talking about bleeding somebody, and they even say probably George Washington died because they were trying to bleed him, uh, and if they just let him recover, he probably would have lived longer. Our medicine is growing as the Lord reveals to us, and we can't create an artificial uh, plan for these bodies. They have to follow how God's designed them. Measurably more. Immeasurably more. He walks with us every moment, every day. And as we say yes, he will use our moments for his purpose. I'll give you, I just was dumbfounded at what the Lord did not too long ago. So Trish and I had recognized that, okay, Sam and Katie, they're my son and daughter-in-law. They're going to go vacation in, in Kentucky where her family is. And they've got four kids, so they've got to figure out how to get four kids from Texas to Kentucky without breaking the bank. And flying was several thousand dollars. So they figured, okay, Katie's going to fly with the two babies and Sam will drive. They haven't driven that far just with the boys in the car. They weren't sure how it would work. So I flew to Houston, drove with him up to Kentucky, and then flew home. So I was there for one task and one task only, to help him survive, you know, 1,500 miles with two little boys in the car. It actually worked pretty well, so on the way home, he didn't need me, he just did it. But guess what happened while we were there? So I had not done a good job of planning. Don't laugh so hard. So there's a cousin that I have in the area that I had sent a text to saying, by the way, I'm going to be in town. When I went to text on that day, the text I had intended to send hadn't gone. So it's like, oh, by the way, I'm here. I've got like five hours today before I go get on the plane. Are you available? If I had planned this, I am, this is Trisha's first, not a, this is one of Trisha's cousins, but she probably would have said, no, this is a bad day. I'm, I can't handle a visitor. But because it was 10 o'clock in the morning, I've got a few hours before I have to leave for the airport. Can you do lunch? She said yes. So we went over. And there's a, re there's a purpose to this. We went over, and she, she was apologizing for how she looked and the, the spirit that was on her. She didn't go to a whole lot of detail at first. But in the course of the visit, she's got my four-month-old grandson, and she's just holding him. Son and daughter-in-law take a walk. We've got the kids, and we start talking. This day that we're there just happens to be the anniversary of the day that her father murdered her mother when she was an infant. She had woken up under the pall of that memory. And she didn't remember this. She was less than a year old when it happened. She was raised by her maternal grandparents. But there's a trauma that has been on her that she's, her whole life has been working to get out from under. And in the course of the conversation, I've shared with her an image that the Lord had done in my meditation. So this is, okay, Lord, let's just go there. There was one time when I was, praying over myself and asking the Lord to show me what was binding me. And he took me to myself as, a crib, in a, as an infant in a crib with the feeling of what was going on in the rest of the house. And that child just sort of zoning out, ready to just be dead inside. But he said, I'm here. And he put himself at the foot of the crib. And the challenge even to me as an infant was to let him pick me up and hold me and to reteach what it meant to be bonded, to be loved, to be held, to not be rejected, to not be neglected, to not be unable to have an attachment. And he had been working on that with me for the weeks prior to this visit. And I shared that. And then as we talked further, we talked about the fact that he would do the same for her. And what would it be like if she let herself imagine him holding her in the same way that she was holding this four-month-old. By the end of the day, when there was a picture taken and we texted it around, 
she wrote the uh, caption in her response, this is the picture of me happy. She had no thought that she was going to feel joy or happiness in that day. But the Lord orchestrated more variables than I could count to put us in that place and to give her that image of him holding her, her wounded self, her longing self to belong in a way that she could feel and something changed. And that's just one small, it's huge for her, but that's just one small part of what he does. He is with each of us. He is with everyone we care about. He is with our every step, our every encounter. And he will do, he has done, and he will continue to do immeasurably more. Immeasurably more than we could ever imagine. In this chapter, he talks about the purpose. His purpose is that the church, hello, church, not the building, the church, you and me, us, that we would walk in this power, that we would support one another as believers, that we would be there because the Holy Spirit is in us to push back the darkness. It says he will show the powers and principalities the truth. These powers and principalities aren't just the governments, not just the businesses. They are the spiritual powers and principalities that want to keep us down. They don't have sway. They may cause an irritant, but they do not have sway because of him in us. One other illustration. So this past week, there was a time whenever it's like, I was just absolutely overwhelmed by all the things that I was supposed to attend to. And when I actually made my to-do list of the things that were most important, over a two day period, I got to about half of the list. But so this, this, this ability of me to think of all the things that have been left undone, need to be done, that threaten on the horizon, that could go wrong, just, it's, you can probably feel what I'm talking about. In the midst of all that, he said, you know, your thoughts are just like a storm. You can pay attention to the storm, or you can listen to my voice. And that was the Holy Spirit rewiring me. He will rewire us. He will change the way we think. He will change the way we look and focus. And he will teach us. And it's a custom lesson. You don't have to learn what I learn. I don't have to learn what you learn or, or your neighbor. He will work in each and every one of us. The way he knows he needs us to grow. To accomplish what he wants to do through us. Because he's given each and every one of us purpose. If musicians can hear me, come on in. Think about the passage. How many of you wrote or circled or felt a highlight to something as it was read? So you've heard me. What I'm saying is not important unless the Holy Spirit is doing something with it for you. But if you felt a lead to a passage in that reading... Pay attention to that. Think about it now. Pray about it now. What does the Lord want to do with you in this next few moments? You know, as the song sung, and then we'll pray a little bit at the end of this. The Lord isn't done. I may be done, and you may be very thankful that I'm done. The Lord isn't done with you. He's not done with us. This sermon's good enough. We're going to sing. But he's still working on you. He's still working on you.
speaking to you right now, stay in that moment. If you need to come forward for prayer, do so during this next hymn. You can come and pray with somebody up front or you can come and kneel and be in prayer. Lord, I just thank you that you are so amazing that you are hearing each and every one of us in this moment. You hear our doubts. You hear our confusion. You hear our hopes. You hear our dreams. You hear our need. You hear our aspiration. And you are receiving us. Precious. Precious ones to you. Lead us, Lord. And when we go from this place, Lord, help us to know that as we sing, we walk with a power that transforms the atmosphere everywhere we go. We praise you for that truth, Lord. In Jesus' name. If you know this hymn, sing loud, because we're learning it. A mighty fortress is our God. Sorry, Sharon, they want me to sing with them so you'll have to put up with my voice Oh! 
reason, I kneel before the Father, from whom every family in heaven and on earth derives its name. I pray that out of his glorious riches, he may strengthen you with the power through his spirit in your inner being, so that Christ might dwell in your hearts through faith. And I pray that you, being rooted and established in love, may have power, together with all the Lord's holy people, to grasp how wide and long and high and deep is the love of Christ, and to know this love that surpasses knowledge, that you may be filled to the measure of all the fullness of God. Now to him who is able to do immeasurably more than all we ask or imagine, according to his power that is at work within us, to him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations forever and ever and ever and ever. Amen. Praise you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Be with us, Lord. Go in peace, brothers, sisters.